All right. Good afternoon and good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Angela Nardozzi. I'm a guest and settler on Turtle Island, and I'm in Toronto, the territory of the Mississaugas, the Haudenosaunee, the Wendat, and uh, also um, I'm here today with my good friend and colleague and mentor, Dr. John Paul Restoul. Uh, bonjour, Jean Paul Restoul, and Dishnikaz. Bonjour, Jean Paul Restoul, and Dishnikaz. Bonjour, Jean Paul Restoul, and Dishnikaz. Bonjour, Jean Paul uh, it's a great day to have a webinar, and um, I just wanted to say that I'm from the Muskrat Clan, um, uh, the Anishinaabek Nation, Doki's First Nation, located in uh, mid-northern Ontario. I don't like to say northern Ontario because I feel like there's a lot north of that area. So um, <laughs> it's like you take the map, you turn it over, and then there's the north. Um, anyway. I, I'm coming to you though from Lekwungen territory and I know Haley's got a land acknowledgement as part of her presentation so I'll let her do that piece uh, but just wanted to say thank you to Shirk for making this possible the Social Sciences Humanities Research Council of Canada it's part of our research into uh, encouraging and supporting teachers in using Indigenous perspectives in their teaching and so it's part of a longer study and there is a survey at the end of the webinar. We hope that you will take the short survey and help us out so that we can help more teachers to do their work in a good way. And that's what this is all about. Absolutely. So today, um, we're so excited to welcome Dakala Haley Gallup. And um, we're going to pass it over to Haley to begin. But just to let you know, um, we're going to be taking questions throughout. So if you'd like to put your questions in the chat, um, John Paul and I will be reading that and fielding those to our guest. Um, so yeah, without further ado, take it away. Good afternoon. Haley Justine, Victoria Naste. My name is Raspberry. I'm from the Taltan First Nations, located at the tip of Northern British Columbia. Um, I currently live in Victoria, BC and I'm excited to be here with you today. To start off, I'd like to acknowledge the territory of the Lekwungen people, Lekwungen speaking peoples in which I live and which I um, have the honor of teaching Lekwungen babies every day. And I wanted to show you a short uh, clip of a short documentary that was filmed by a indigenous filmmaker, Eli, Eli Hurdle, and directed by Lekwungen uh, community members. So we're gonna start with that. I'm gonna go and share my screen. Here we go. Okay. We're going to present. Here we go. We're going to start at 3.34. This is a great video. Thanks so much for bringing it to us, Haley. Thank you. I thought it was important to start with this video because our because our presentation today is about place-based education. So it's important to understand the place in which you are living, working, and really get to know it, really understand what your relationship is to that place. And so this is us just modeling that today. For my ancestors, um, both uh, Songhees and Isquamo nations, at one time we were one community um, that spanned from um, Royal Roads over to um, Cordova Bay into, um, into the Saanich area and all the way down to the south into what we refer to as Kajas Discovery Island, as well as the southwestern side of the San Juan Island. We're traditionally made of seven major family groups and within those families there's a multiple families and they live in a larger area. From my understanding this beautiful space that we're in occupied over 14 different villages. The breakdowns are we're because of the, the foods and um, the locations that we we had all around the Victoria area, and those were the Kwangan people. 
So where we are today in Egan, or the colonized name is Beacon Hill, um, it's part of the Swing Wong family group. Uh, out towards um, Oak Bay and Saanich and down into the San Juan Islands, that was known as the uh, Chaconan family group. And that's where my family group is from. But I connect to all the other family groups. We're just families that respect each other's territories. I was born and raised on Chatham Island, Jess, for the first 10 years of my life. Such a heaven on earth. Still home. Still home to me. Always will be. From my understanding as place to smoke herring people, um, Lakwangan, that was our original name for this area. And Songhees and Isquimo became acquired names through contact and through negotiation. Meaning as it's been taught to me, is um, our word Lekwang, which means um, smoked herring. And then Lekwangan means place to smoke herring. And then Lekwangan often refers to the language of this land. An elder once said that you have to speak the language of the land. The language brings forward light and understanding around um, our lands and water resources in a different way that um, provides a cultural scope and perspective that isn't tangible using the English language, but tangible in a cultural perspective that reaches into our spirit and heart as individuals. I'm always swallowing heart and mind. I swallowing the goodness of your heart. I hope you enjoyed that uh, short clip of that uh, short documentary there. The clip itself or the film itself is available on Vimeo for anybody to watch. So if you want to go and and watch that you can. First, I wanna let you know that we are gonna be covering teaching examples from kindergarten to grade 12. We are going to be exploring stories of my own teaching experience. So things that I've done. Oh, I got questions popping up on the screen here. <laughs> what level do you teach? Sorry, I just launched the poll. Sorry about that, Haley. I'm sorry that I distracted you. <laughs> No worries. <laughs> it went with you. It went with what you were saying, though. Do you see how I timed that? Boom. Yeah. <laughs> it was like you heard us and did that for us. <laughs> um, so essentially, I'm going to be sharing stories of my own teaching practice and experience, um, sh sharing and showing you uh, some pictures and videos from that. I'm also going to be celebrating some amazing work that um, colleagues of mine are doing here in Victoria, as well as in Taltan territory. I know that there's so many of you who are watching right now who are also doing amazing work in your territories and, and where you're from. And I would love to hear about it. I mean, if you want to contact me, send me emails or, or whatnot about the amazing stuff that you're doing, I would really love to, to connect because this is, we're, we're, we're educators, we should connect. This is amazing stuff. Um, any riddles, I'm gonna move on. <laughs> Place. All right, oops. So this, this slide here is a set of questions. You take some time to read it. Um, essentially, I curated these questions or these questions have been asked to me in my understanding or in my journey of relationship to the land that I'm on right now. Um, elders have asked me some of these questions. Uh, I think John Paul's maybe asked me some of these questions uh, in your class at UVic. Um, community members and that sort of thing. And I encourage you to take these questions, maybe take a screenshot. Uh, I can send them in a document later um, and spend some time reflecting on them. Yeah, <laughs> spend some time reflecting on them. Journal, uh, answer, try to answer them for yourself. Some of them you can answer very easily. Some of them you might 
be like, whoa, I've never thought of that before. Or um, why would you ask me where my ancestors are buried? And why do you want to know that? It helps us understand where you come from and who you are as a human and helps us understand what your relationship to the place that you're living in right now is. And it helps you understand that as well. Uh, that's a short answer to that question. But um, yeah, I really encourage this mindfulness practice and really taking, taking time to develop and cultivate a relationship with the land that you are currently living and working on. I also wanted to start with a, a picture of some of my students. You can't see their faces, uh, which is good. <laughs> um, here's a picture of some of my students. So a couple of colleagues and I decided it would be a good idea to take our entire school on a fishing trip this year. And we did it. And it was amazing. We all had so much fun. Not everybody got a chance to fish, only the intermediate students. And even, even then a select few of our intermediate students because um, legally, you have to be status First Nations from this territory to fish in that, uh, in, in that stream, in Goldstream Park. Um, how did we get here? How did we end up having this amazing trip? All 135 of our students came, maybe a couple stayed home. I'm not too sure exactly of the exact numbers, but we put all of our kids on a bus, two buses, drove them all the way out to Goldstream Park. And we had an elder come and do a salmon ceremony. We had parents come and we were teaching our children how to gaff fish and dip net fish. Traditional means of fishing that has been used for centuries by our people. Um, it all started with a conversation, of course, and a conversation necessarily around protocol. Uh, the first thing that comes to my mind when I think about incorporating Indigenous content, ways of being, um, doing activities like this on the land, I think about protocol first. Um, for me, as a visitor here, um, I, <laughs> I got to contact people, I got to ask permission for things. So a simple protocol, and I think just respect, what we did uh, as a team of four educators, we separated the tasks. And one of the tasks was to talk to some chiefs, talk to the chiefs from Sartlet First Nations, Songhees First Nations and Esquimalt First Nations, bring them a gift, ask them for permission to be fishing in their territory. That is an important step to be taken. Not all people would take that step or even think to take that step, but I think it's important. A uh, second step that we took is uh, a colleague and I went to an elder's home and we, we brought her a gift, a little gift something that she could use. We brought her tea and other things like that. And we sat with her for a little while, listened to her telling stories, I got to know each other a little bit because I'm a visitor, I'm a stranger to her. So I'm not gonna just show up at her door and be like, hey, can you do this for me? <laughs> I wanna spend some time with her cultivating a relationship and making sure she feels respected. Um, towards the end of our visit, we had the opportunity to ask her if she would be able to help us by doing a salmon ceremony before we go fishing. Because in anything we do as Indigenous people, ceremony is very important. And fishing is a way of, as a means of harvesting. And in my tradition, it's, it's important to, to do that ceremony before, before we harvest. And here on the island it is as well. And she was thrilled. She was so ecstatic about the concept of us taking the whole school fishing and she, brought her red ochre, she brought her rattles, she brought her, her regalia, and all 135, 140 kids sat on the, the bank of the water there and just were in awe of her. So quiet, the quietest I've ever seen them, actually, on the day. <laughs> um, and she shared songs, prayers, blessing the water, blessing the fish that we were about to harvest, thanking Mother Earth, and she shared teachings of kindness and compassion and um, speaking truth to people. And it was so beautiful. After she was done her ceremony, we presented her with a blanket as a gift, her and her helper as well. And then we set out on our fishing journey. About seven or so kids went into the water with some adults and gaffed and dip net fished and they had a blast. They were in there for about I don't even know. They were in there for a couple of hours and it was cold. A couple of them had to come out 
of the, well, not all of them, I shouldn't say a couple of them, all of them had to come out of the water, empty their rubber boots. They were full of water at least five times or more if I wasn't looking and they just kept going back out there. I'm like, wow, this is amazing. Um, and we ended up catching about four or five fish that day, which is pretty cool. Um, it was pretty late in the spawning season. I'm not too sure like how good they were. So we were trying <laughs> to catch the good ones. And um, we were gonna save them for our feast because we have a feast at the, end of the, at the end of the year at our school, but we just said, you know what? The families can take it home. So the people, the kids who caught the fish, that they, they took it home to their families. And that was a really good gift for them. <sighs> An amazing, amazing day. So another thing that happened before this trip was me as the Indigenous support teacher at the school, I had to come up with a list of resources and lesson plans and that sort of thing to send to teachers because we're taking the whole school. How do we prepare them to understand why we're even, even there? How do we get them to understand the, the salmon cycle and all these things in a culturally appropriate way, embedding, embedding our Indigenous ways of knowing? So I spent a lot of time gathering resources that were relevant to Vancouver Island and Victoria as well. So I sent all of those resources to the teachers and I also did a few lesson, lessons in uh, the classrooms for whatever teacher invited me. We did drumming, we did circle, we talked about the salmon cycle, we made 3D salmon, 3D salmon eggs, and we made like a little cycle. It was so cute. And uh, another lesson that I did I actually had a sub in for me that day, so, and she was amazing. Um, she, and she used a lesson template that I gave her that was created by uh, local elder Butch Dick, and it's a lesson on the salmon ceremony itself. And she did an amazing job, so I heard. <laughs> but um, it's a lesson that can be found on the Indigenous Education Department website here at the School District 61, and you can have access to it whenever. So I can share that as well towards the end of the webinar or have a document ready of all the links that I have. <laughs> but, but yeah, this took a lot of time. It didn't, didn't happen in one day. It took a lot of time to organize. It took uh, a team. It wasn't just me. It was a lot of people involved and all the teachers on board teaching their kids about the cycles and that sort of thing. And, you know, I just wanted to ask the audience right now, in this entire story that I just shared, where do you see STEM? Mm. Where, where do you see STEM happening here? That's a great prompt. Thanks for sh sharing that story to start this off, Haley. And yeah, I'll invite people um, to put their answers in the chat. Where do you see STEM? Where do you see science, technology, engineering, mathematics um, in this trip? Um, John Paul, I'm curious, um, where do you see STEM? Let's start with you. Ah, you're putting me on the spot, huh? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, definitely, well, someone's answering now the oh, yes. salmon life cycle, uh, life cycle of fish. Um, oh, interesting, science probability. Um, so I, I, I was going to say that's the most obvious one is the fish, but also like the, the interconnection between the ecosystem and all the parts within it and how they work together. Um, your seasonal aspects too. Um, and I think the technology of the nets is, is an important part of it. Um, I was just going to ask you while we were waiting for some of these answers to, to be coming in. Uh, Haley, were some of the students in your class from local First Nations? I would imagine at Craig Flower, many of them are. So in order for us to even do this trip, the, only, the students that were allowed in the water were the students who were from the Kwanian territory. So the students who carried a song news or a Squamalt status card. A lot of our intermediate students who were urban Indigenous or from different nations, they were so mad. They were so sad. They're like, why can't we fish? And <laughs> Well, um, so the government created this thing called the Indian Act, and we went into a whole, <laughs> whole spiel. Uh, some of my kids, I had to actually give them the legit reason why, as to why they weren't allowed. Um, and then one of my students was like, why is the government doing this to us? And I was like, yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> but anyways. Um, <laughs> that's awesome. So it's not just STEM. It's, it's also learning politics and history. and Yeah. 
Yeah, wonderful how this kind of uh, ignites all of those things. Just, you know, as a, a one activity does all of this reconnection of identity and land and uh, nation and, and families, but also how the legislation is, is attempting to disconnect you from all those things. So that's well, how powerful, powerful uh, activity to do with the kids. There are other in, um, answers coming into the chat as well. People connecting it even to environmental science, outdoor ed, talking about how students can make their own rods, people talking about relationship to land, but also looking at the behavior of the water. And um, yeah, also I love how people in the audience are thinking outside of STEM too. They're talking about bringing in the spirit bringing in elders knowledge. So there's like such a, like just in this one example, there's such a fusion, you know, John Paul was talking about, you know, talking to the students about colonialism, politics. I can see this even ballooning into advocacy for their own rights. Like, woof, Haley, like, wow. Very cool. All of you who uh, gave all those answers. I love that you're thinking uh, that, that there's all of these things connected into this one activity. It, learning, everything is connected. Everything is interconnected. There's always a multidisciplinary aspect to, to everything that you're doing. So thank you for uh, sharing all those answers. Shall we move on to the next one? Okay. The next slide is, what is science? I took this uh, quote from Adosti and Judy Thompson's uh, amazing work on Force for the Future unit plan um, in Shimshan territory. This quote says, what is science? It's Latin root scientia, I think I said it right, means knowledge, which comes from the Latin verb skier or skier, I might have said that wrong too, to know. Essentially, science just means to know. And that's cool. And in my brain, I think, well, to know, that means that there, is, there are many ways of knowing, there are what, many ways of being, and the Western thought or the Western way of knowing isn't the ultimate, it isn't the universal, and it isn't the only acceptable way of knowing when we think of science. So this means that all ways of knowing, every culture around the world has a place in science, and that excites me. The next thing here. So what is bringing indigenous STEM knowledge into the classroom look like? I made this short little list. These are some actions to take or maybe how it looks. So the first thing you do in my, in my worldview, in my perspective is consult the first people's principles of learning. For those of you who don't know what that is, that's a document that was created by the First Nations Education Steering Committee and yeah, all of that rolled out. <laughs> um, and uh, they are principles that are supposed to guide learning in a good way for you when you're creating your lesson plans, when you're creating your unit plans and that sort of thing. For me, these principles guide everything I do in the classroom. And they kind of help bring everything together for me. And I also kind of use them in assessment a little bit as well. Um, yeah, so I'll start with that. <laughs> When you're picking resources, they need to be culturally and locally relevant, and they also need to be appropriate and relevant. Um, there are a lot of resources out there that are inappropriate, that are outdated, that use inappropriate terms and language, and um, maybe they're not relevant to the, the, to the land that you're on. Maybe they're not relevant to the people who, who you're teaching or to the local people here. Um, so take a look at your resources and be critical about them. Um, I know when I was in John Paul's indigenous education class, he gave this sheet of paper that said, how can you tell if a resource is appropriate or legitimate? Maybe he'll share that with us because <laughs> I can't seem to find it in my notes. <laughs> but it's a quick cheat sheet on how to, um, how to go about making sure your resources are appropriate for your classroom. The next thing is, building relationships with local community members, such as elders or other knowledge keepers. This is so important. I cannot tell you how important relationships are. I should have put that first. When you're in a community, you're, you're a community. You're not just a school. You're not just a, a teacher. You're, 
You're not just teaching the curriculum. You are a part of a community, a part of a whole, especially if you're in an in indigenous community as well. Um, you will be surprised like how much knowledge comes from our from our local communities and how much they're willing to help and be a part of your classroom and be a part of what you're doing. Um, I recommend going to going to the band office, seeing what you seeing what you can be a part of, um, seeing if you can be part of their after school programs and that sort of thing. Um, and maybe you can host events and that sort of thing as well, or just any way that you can build relationships in a good way. Um, that's important. Now, for me, going to the elder's house in that example that I showed earlier, I had no idea who she was, but the people in my school community knew who she was and she had a relationship with them prior, but I had to build that relationship with her before I could even ask her to, to, to do the ceremony for me. So I didn't phone her. <laughs> I found a, I found, um, found her address from her, her daughters and stuff. I said, just go visit her. <laughs> so I did. I was scared and I was like, oh, I'm a stranger. <laughs> But I did. I went. I went in. I knocked on the door. She wasn't home, so I had to go. Actually, I had to go three times. Um, she wasn't home, and she doesn't like being called that much. So, <laughs> so I went in at the third time, and we sat and chit chatted, like I said, and we got to know each other. And then I asked for permission. But when asking, I gave her a gift as well, just to be reciprocal and just to be respectful, because that's important as well. The next thing for your classroom for bringing into, oh, you got a question? I do, if that's okay. First of all, mm -hmm. I just want to point out that I think it's really um, powerful that even, you know, though you're a Talton woman, you're talking about the fact that you felt nervous, right? And that it wasn't a seamless process, right? You, you know, you had to show up a few times. It was kind of, oh, how am I going to find this person? Because I think a lot of our teachers who maybe are settlers, Yes, on Turtle Island, they, they also feel that and that stops them. Um, so thank you for sharing that and being vulnerable. And also there was a question and I, you know, Haley, I don't know uh, if you want to address this, John Paul, maybe you want to jump in too. Uh, the question is from Teresa, what is the difference between an elder and a knowledge keeper? Do you have any thoughts on that, Haley and John Paul, or is that kind of like, that's another webinar? I'll let my elder go first. Oh my goodness, I can't believe you pulled that one. <laughs> <clears throat> well, then you can correct me. <laughs> um, I find it hard to answer that question because it seems like it comes mostly with um, a community set of expectations and relationships. So, um, some folks are treated like elders, even uh, not tied to their uh, age, but rather with their amount of knowledge, their kind of uh, way of being, their actions. So they, <clears throat> they're treated like someone who, who lives the life as well as teaches about it and talks about it and demonstrates through their actions how, how to be a good, insert name of nation there, uh, but they, they kind of have the values and principles and, and live by them. Uh, a knowledge keeper might be someone who knows a lot about a particular area. And um, so you might be um, recommended to go and see X or Y because he or she is very uh, knowledgeable in the ways of plants or they know a lot about um, gathering or they know a lot about traditional ways of fishing. So go and see that person. And so they, they may be knowledge keepers, but they're not necessarily folks who are seen as in a holistic way, living, living the whole life by those traditional principles and, and teachings, um, which would make that other person that status of elder. Um, I don't know. That's, that's my quick on the spot answer. Um, Haley now can correct me. <laughs> Everything you said was right. Everything you said was good. <laughs> um, I agree that, uh, an elder may not be a knowledge keeper. Um, an elder may just be somebody who is older. Um, but sometimes we have the lovely combination of an elder and a knowledge keeper who have knowledge of our languages, our ceremony, um, fishing or hunting or gathering or um, gardening and all of these wonderful things. Um, but like John Paul mentioned, it's all interconnected with relationships and kind of judged by the community itself, right? So 
Yeah, I would say watch out for those ones who are self-appointed elders. You want those ones who um, everyone else says that they are. Um, and I think it's important too, when you were mentioning knowledge keeper, I was thinking that's another important point is um, some of them are appointed to be keepers of knowledge. Some just grow into it. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them don't really see themselves as knowing so much. Like I remember back in Ontario, um, uh, Jan Longboat was always saying like, I need to close down my garden so I can go and learn from the elders. And we're thinking, everyone thinks you're an elder. <laughs> so um, it's amazing how like someone can be appointed that role too. Like you are responsible for knowing our history. And so you need to know these things and, and they take it on as a responsibility. So that's an important piece too. Exactly. Maybe. Yeah, I'm ready for that question. That was a brain teaser. Um, moving on, the next thing for bringing Indigenous STEM and knowledge into the classroom is get out on the land. Bring your kids outside. Have hands-on activities. The land is our classroom. The land is our teacher. That's that's a way of knowing. That's a that's a way of being. And I think it's amazing when we give our students the opportunity to be on the land and to to learn on the land because we believe that it is our classroom. And project experience-based learning always wins for me. Um, my teaching style is all about this. I'm always outside, I'm always doing fun things, I'm doing projects and that sort of stuff with kids. And it may look like there's chaos going on in the room, but it's organized and it's fun. And kids are working on different things and they're working with their hands. And you know, I firmly believe that my students are my greatest teachers. And the land is also my teacher. Um, I learn so much from them every time that they're doing a project and they're like, they have ideas and all these other things to make it better or to, oh, I, I messed up on this part and I can, ah, oh, what should I do? And just the way they, they brainstorm and that sort of thing. And I, don't, I just think that so much comes, so much um, beauty comes out of doing these types of uh, learnings. Yeah, anyways, moving on. <laughs> so, um, I took this table from a document, which I think is gold. Um, the first people's principles of learning. You, if you don't know about those, you can go online and find them. Um, I got this handed to me during my education degree and I cannot find it online. I searched on the, the indigenous education website and uh, the Victoria website. I'm thinking about taking pictures and making it a link for you so you can have it. But essentially it's, the principle, that's on here anyway, the, the principle, uh, the perspective and worldview in which that principle sprung, which it came from, and then what does it look like in the classroom? So this is one of the principles that I thought pertained really nicely or went really nicely uh, with play space and Indigenous STEM. And what does it look like in the classroom? C create learning opportunities for students to make deeper connections between information, knowledge, and the world outside of the classroom, which is awesome. Um, begin with looking at local contexts when teaching and then moving outward. Now, I didn't put everything that was listed on this paper in me, this example, because there's more. I just put the things that pertained only to place-based Indigenous STEM for, for this uh, webinar. But I'll check out, this, check out this document when you get the chance. I'll link it into a document for you. It's amazing. Okay. So place-based Indigenous STEM, what what are some of its values? What, what does it bring forth and that sort of thing? It's founded, founded in reciprocal relationship with land and the local community. That's what I, I, I firmly believe this in my worldview, my perspective. Um, it helps our students make sense of our diverse world and build relationships with our relatives, the plants and animals. When we treat the land as a classroom and as our teacher, we develop a relationship and we develop a reciprocal, respect, reciprocal and respectful relationship which helps us understand ourselves. Um, promotes a stewardship and caretaker mindset in our students, which I think is important, and will aid us in the fight against climate change. If we care about our, our world, we care about our mother earth, we learn from the plants and animals like we were supposed to, like we originally did, and we instill that worldview and perspective in our students that care in, for mother earth, I think that the, the generation that they are, that that when they grow up, they will 
they will do amazing things in protecting our mother earth. I ju that's just what I see. That's what I hope for. That's my romanticized view of it all. But that's what I hope for anyways. And I have a video that kind of talks about uh, worldview. And this is kind of what we're doing in our classrooms when we're bringing in Indigenous STEM and play space is we're, we're talking about shifting a perspective. We're talking about shifting a worldview into one where, one that is inclusive and relationship-based and um, respectful of Mother Earth. So I'm gonna share this. Her name is Robin Walkimmerer. You should read her book. It's called Braiding Sweetgrass, It Changed My Life. And <laughs> you should really listen to her talk and oh, watch all of her stuff. She's incredible. Okay, here we go. We are gonna be on 7.45. 7.45. Okay, perfect. We're gonna play. As well. Because the stories of our people and the story of Omimi converge for both were swept away by the same wind. And we know what happens when two winds, two weather fronts collide, great turbulence and often suffering for the ones below. And two winds, two worldviews met on this continent, worldviews which color our relations with the living land, which shape our answer to the question of what does land mean? A worldview in which land was understood as sacred, as our sustainer, our pharmacy, our identity, our home, our library, the place where we play out our moral responsibility in return for our very lives, peopled with our non-human relatives. This is a way of being in which the tar sands are unthinkable. This view of the earth suddenly encountered another view, a kind of climate change in values. The whole notion of land as a set of relationships and moral responsibilities was replaced by the notion of land as rights, rights to land as property. And what our people called the gifts of the land suddenly became natural resources, ecosystem services, and capital. Nature as family became nature as machine and our non-human relatives, our teachers, became mere objects for consumption. This is a way of being that invites us to the tar sands. This is the same question that has us teetering on the precipice of unparalleled extinction and climate chaos. Is the land a source of belongings or a source of belonging? That's a question that, yeah, that's, yeah. <laughs> and it's home. Um, I decided to show this clip because what I'm talking about in this webinar is instilling the concept of place-based education as a journey, as a relationship that keeps growing with the land itself and the original caretakers of this land. And that Indigenous STEM in itself is shifting a worldview about, um, about science and about your own way of being into one that is um, sustainable for our planet and to one where you know we are all in this together in a sense and i really i really appreciate uh robin wall Kimmerer because she calls us all to action and she says that this worldview is accessible to all of us every nation every um every nation or indigenous uh, group has uh, their own perspectives and worldview but this one where we all love Mother Earth and uh, take care of it. That's, that's one we're all welcome to. Anyways, moving on to the next part of the webinar is teaching examples from, from my personal teaching journey and as well as uh, celebrating educators who I think are amazing. Yeah. So urban setting. Believe it or not, there are a lot of uh, things that you can do as an as a urban uh, educator. We may be limited in some of our spaces where some of our uh, schools are just located in the midst of downtown, in the midst of all the all the noise. But you can make it happen. You can make land based education a thing. You just gotta you just gotta maybe go on a field trip, <laughs> take the whole school somewhere. <laughs> um, 
this is a example of a field trip. This is another whole school field trip when I was a practicum student and I was a indigenous kindergarten teacher. Ah, I miss kindergarten, it's so fun. So what we did here is we took all of our kids to Witty's Lagoon here um, in the Kwangan territory. And some teachers may have had their own activities to do for all their kids and stuff, but our class, our main goal was to let our kids play in nature. Just, just let them play. Let them build a relationship with the land. Let them explore. Let them fall out of the tree. Let them, one of our students took off his muddy buddy, took off his shoes and went running into the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> or like there's a little uh, little thing of water. I don't know what it's called, like a tide pool or something. <laughs> I forget. Anyways, um, he was just laying in it, bellies in and playing with the crabs and stuff. And I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> but this is the students. They're building that relationship with, with, with the land and they're learning so much through play. And I believe that's, that's such a Mm, that's such a good way to learn is through play. And I think that giving our students these experiences on the land when they're small and even going into middle school and secondary school, these are the memories that they make that are going to stick with them, that they're going to think, yeah, I, 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 love, I love our earth and I learned so much out there. Oh my goodness. And just amazing memories. We learned to look, we get a little crab here. We learned a lot about different uh, crab species and that sort of thing. And every two minutes, another a student was coming up to me, Miss Gallup, look a crab, Miss Gallup, look a crab. And we were look, looking at it and I had to be, I had to express the same level of excitement for every single thing, but it was, it was awesome. <laughs> um, the next teaching example in my indigenous kindergarten classroom, again, we did a unit on cedar. Um, here on Vancouver Island, cedar is super important. Cedar is so essential to their way of life. It's a medicine. It, they, rely, they rely on cedar for their big houses, making their big houses, making clothing, making tools, boats, canoes, paddles, you know, like so many things. The list goes on. Um, so I decided to do a unit on cedar because all my students in the Indigenous kindergarten were in mostly First Nations from Vancouver Island and super culturally and locally relevant to them. So what we did was we read stories about cedar and we had some examples, some, some actual made examples that the kids can touch, see, feel of mats that were made. And we had an example of a cedar bow and that sort of thing. And at the end of the lesson, the students we're taught how to make cedar rope. And now doing that in kindergarten is really hard um, because we, we have to work really good, up, really, really hard on our fine motor skills. But, um, and I, I realized like even when you're doing, because doing this simple thing, making cedar rope, like the teachings that come from cedar, like learning, it takes time. Learning requires patience. Cedar is teaching you lessons while you're working on it and that sort of thing. And just, bringing that into the classroom and reminding the students that Cedar's teaching you a lesson while you're working. Um, so be patient and all, all these things and all these energies are going into what you're making was, um, it was an interesting time, but the students were really proud of their, of their bracelets. I, I thought it was a really fun lesson. And to me, that was a great way to bring STEM to them in the class. A question has come from the chat around um, the cedar stories and asking if there are titles of the stories, but I'm not sure, are you referring to like books or videos or are these teachings that you were talking to the students about? Can you tell us more? So um, I'm talking about Strong Nations books. There's a few Strong Nations uh, books that are out there that are about cedar and they're really appropriate for young children. I can't really, I think one's called Cedar and the other, there's a couple called the Tree of Life. Um, yeah, just speaking of the Tree of Life, actually, that's what it's known as here, is the Tree of Life. It is so essential to this, to this uh, culture here. Um, I can't give you all the titles of the books that we read because we read a couple off the top of my head. This was like two years ago. Um, <laughs> but uh, if you look at Strong Nations Publishing, you will get the titles. 
Great. I put um, strongnations.com in the chat for people to look at. And just as a follow-up question, you know, you said this, I, you, you've translated this idea of locally relevant, like what's locally relevant? And uh, Teresa is from um, nor northern, northwestern Ontario, and she, she's asking, it, could it be something dominant in her area? So um, there's a lot of evergreen trees and rock. Like, is it about dominance or when you think about locally relevant, is it cultural? Like, can you tell me more? What do you think? I believe that's more of like a cultural thing more of what the community has deemed sacred or what the community has deemed uh, re re relevant or important to them. Um, something that they use um, all the time. For myself, I come from a land of pines and spruce. I don't have a lot of cedars in, in my territory. I wish we did, uh, but uh, we use the spruce tree as, as uh, medicine sometimes, I think. Correct me if I'm wrong, those tall fans out there. Um, <laughs> and um, we use a lot of pine for building our shelters and that sort of thing. But, but yeah, the, the cedar is really relevant here on the island. There's a lot of cedar or there, there used to be a lot of cedar. Um, and it's also a little, it's also convenient scientifically as well, thinking about the wood itself. Uh, it doesn't really rot. So they had access to wood that doesn't, doesn't rot. So they, they were gonna use it thinking about that. But, um, but yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, I, for me, since I'm an urban indigenous uh, person, I've been living in this territory for about five years and other territories for most of my childhood as well. So I've got lots to learn about my own territory and about what we think is sacred, what we think is important, um, what trees are important to us and that sort of thing. So I think that's a question that um, is amazing to ask, uh, but maybe try asking somebody in the community or if John Paul has something to say. Yeah, I agree with everything you're saying, Haley. I just wanted to, maybe this is like a, a little bit too um, self-promotional, but I it, our next webinar, we're going to have uh, Shawneen Pete join us. And one of the things that Shawneen uh, has recommended is uh, uh, birch bark biting. So it's a surprisingly um, simple to start task and you, you can feel really accomplished in, in uh, doing it. And it it helps with teaching mathematical principles and patterns and things like that. So that might be something for folks who are further east and some of the birch bark uh, teachings that go with that. And I just want to say, seeing the the cedar um, bracelets, uh, that's something my kids and I have done. And you have such a sense of accomplishment when you do it because it's not that hard to to do it, but it looks so cool, and you feel good when you do it. You go, oh wow, I actually can can do this. And um, uh, it, it's a like a tangible physical reminder too of those cedar teachings, and you're wearing them around, and yet it brings to mind those stories. So I, I love it as a as a takeaway too. And the cedar that was provided in this lesson was from the Indigenous Education Department here um, in our school district. I didn't go and harvest it myself. I'm not trained. I'm not. Um, I don't have the protocols. I don't know the protocols necessary to do that for myself. So I have to build relationships and community and, and uh, get it that way. Mm -hmm. okay. Next slide. Thank you for those questions. Uh, there were a couple more too, Haley. Someone was wanting to know what's in the bowl and, uh, and also if, whether that was cedar tea was a question. Cedar tea, okay. Uh, what was in the bowl is actually cedar bark. So I have a thing of cedar bark here. This is what it would look like. Um, that, this is what's in the bowl. So what I do is I soak it and I soak it overnight and then I take pieces of cedar off because then it's nice and soft. I take strips off and then I had to come in really early that day to prep. Well, let me tell you, it took a long time because working with cedar is a spiritual thing and it takes a lot of patience. So yeah. This is what this is what's in the bowl. <laughs> I'm in the process of making uh, kits for kids right now because we're in the midst of a uh, pandemic. So we're going to try to keep kids busy on making cedar rose kits for all of our students and hopefully all of our staff and a video tutorial of how to do that as well. Yeah. Any riddles? <laughs> Moving on. Uh, continuing on our cedar unit, I thought, why don't I bring uh, somebody in my classroom who is a First Nations artist and knowledge keeper in this regard. Um, so this is a 
This is uh, Joshua Watts, who is a new Chalmers uh, carver. And he came in and he did an amazing presentation for our kids. Uh, he brought some masks that he's made. He's told stories about them. He did a whole presentation about uh, dugout canoes and the importance, the significance of canoes and for the for Vancouver Island First Nations and that sort of thing. And the kids were just glued to him. They were so excited. And uh, one story he told, I'll never forget, uh, he showed pictures from way back in the day, black and white photos of a whole bunch of canoes in the inner harbor here where the parliament building is and the empress and stuff is and he said yeah um he said uh <laughs> back in the day the harbor was our parking lot and that sort of thing and the kids laughed and i laughed it was good good stuff and it just really reminded you of the significance the importance of the canoe to our people right and and how it really connected us and that's that's really cool Another thing that he did was he showed our students how to use tools. He brought his tool bag and uh, demonstrated on a block of cedar how to use an as, which was really cool. Um, it's like an axe sort of thing, but not necessarily an axe. It's kind of curved. I, yeah. <laughs> and noodles. Um, yeah, in kindergarten, it works. In all grades, it works. Uh, having somebody coming into your classroom and talking about um, talking about First Nations art, because it is science, it is STEM as well. Um, it's, it takes a lot of skill, it takes a lot of patience, a lot of time to learn this skill. And you have somebody in the community who is, you have a relationship with, who's willing to come in and share that craft with the students, that's amazing. Your kids are gonna love it. Yeah. Yeah. You're muted. Sorry, I forgot to unmute. Um, so I just was looking at this picture and thinking of a question that has come up in our webinar before, which is, um, or maybe it's something we've talked about, which is this idea of having to try and represent Indigenous culture in the classroom so that the students who are Indigenous uh, young people are seeing themselves in education. And also, you've got a mixed classroom, so you're, you have non-Indigenous kids in there as well. And then they get like a window into our way of being and doing. And so the, the idea of there being both a mirror and a window in education, I'm wondering, do you see that in your classroom when you bring in folks like this um, and, and what impact it has? I do. I see that in when I bring in folks like this to be mentors for my kids or when I'm teaching certain topics as well. Like for example, when I brought in my own button blanket and got the kids to help me figure out how to uh, or where to put the buttons and stuff and they were just so drawn to it. Um, for this example here with the mask, the carver, um, they're from the New Chalmers, New New Chalmers Nation and a lot of my kids in this class right here, they were part New Chalmers and Laquan and, and Kokwaki back there. It's really, really mixed intertwined. Um, but it was really cool for them to, to see a a young, a young indigenous ma male from a new Chalmers nation um, in our classroom and bringing such an amazing craft. And they're like, wow, I see myself. This is cool. I'm like, again, with the elder um, example in a fishing trip, they're just so engaged, right? And so this, this class this year, they are really hard to, like, to uh, they're really wiggly. <laughs> um, I had a hard time sometimes getting them to focus. So this, it's really amazing when you have those moments where they feel like they're super connected to the content. Like this is who they are. And they're just like, whoa, I'm, I'm, I'm tuned in now. And me as an urban indigenous uh, student growing up, it would have been amazing to, to see, you know, some of the local First Nations um, in my classroom as well. Um, can't really expect teachers to teach me about my nation because they probably don't even know where it is. Um, but teaching them about the local nations where we are and learning about them really is a window also for urban indigenous kids to explore themselves too, um, which I think is an important topic to bring up because yeah, we often have non-indigenous kids and then we have indigenous kids from the territory that you're on. And then we have indigenous kids who are Inuit Métis or from a nation from wherever, like wherever in Canada or the States, yeah. I just wanted to point out, I mean, first of all, thanks John Paul for bringing that sort of perspective in because we have heard that from different webinars. Um, it strikes me that Haley, 
I know that you have a few, quite a few more examples to go through, and I don't want to rush you, but I also don't want to keep you too, too longer than, and I don't know what you're doing this evening. I, I mean, all of our social lives are packed these days. Um, so it's 7.54. Um, I'm okay to stay a little bit longer. I might need to run out to the baby, but um, I, I don't need to be here necessarily. John Paul and Haley, do you guys have a few more minutes? We can keep the recording going and people can stay if they want, or how is people's time? I'm good to stay. <laughs> All right, let's keep going then, and we'll go until we go, and hopefully people can join us for as long as possible, um, perhaps maybe 10 to 15 more minutes. Um, and if I pop out and pop back in, you'll know why. Perfect. Thank you so much for reminding us all the time. <laughs> I guess we'll move on, but thank you for that question. Um, this is a short little video talking about bringing your students out on the land. This is our Indigenous kindergarten class this year with their amazing uh, teacher, Miss Miss Cossack, and their matriarch, matriarch from the Wakiwak Nation and Indigenous uh, Education Assistant, uh, Crystal Cook, planting cedar trees. Okay. Love you. Yeah, I love you. I hope you grow big. I hope it rains today. Can you push all around it? It rains. It yeah. rains. I hope it gives you lots of water today. I see some big clouds, so it's a good day for planting. Okay, you keep. So this clip just embodies who we are. Like I, we always say that we're like a teaching trio, Miss Cossack, Miss Cook, and I. Um, our values are getting the kids outside, letting them play outside, developing a relationship with the land and having a reciprocal relationship, relationship to the land. This is such a beautiful way to teach that to your primary students and even to your middle or high school students. It's all, it always feels good to give back to the earth in this way. Yeah. Um, now we're going to go to a rural setting. <laughs> um, Oftentimes the rule gets left out of conversations and I wanted to bring it in um, because it's really important to me because I come from a remote community and they're doing incredible things. And that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about my community and the amazing things that they're doing out there um, that I wish I could be a part of and that I am going to hopefully be a part of when I move home at the end of this summer. Okay. So I'm from Taltan First Nations, which is located at the t northern tip of uh, British Columbia. Um, we're about eight hours south of Whitehorse, B, uh, Yukon, and uh, eight hours north of Terrace, BC. And we have three communities, Dees Lake, Telegraph Creek, and Iskew. And this is our territory here. I first want to talk about language um, revitalization and language in the classrooms. I think that it is, if you have the opportunity, and if the nations have um, accepted or gave permission to incorporate language in your school and in your classroom, I think that's an amazing thing to do. It's an incredible thing to do because languages hold a worldview. Languages hold an entire perspective, an entire way of being, an entire way of knowing. And a lot of our languages are, are dying or disappearing. In Taliesin territory, in Taliesin territory, we have an amazing language council who is working so hard at um, preventing that. They're creating or working with UVic to have programs to teach all the adults um, the language. They have language nests up in our territory in all communities, which has babies from zero to five, where they're just immersed in the language. And the people who graduate from, the, from a language diploma program in our territory um, that's connected with UVic, they end up being teachers in our schools, uh, our public schools, uh, Taliesin language teachers. And they go to all the classrooms, I think all the classrooms, like correct me if I'm wrong, all you tell 10 viewers, maybe they don't go to the printing video grades like grade 10 or 12, I'm not too sure, but they go to these classrooms and they teach language and culture. They do lessons. And that's so cool. Um, having this present for our kids in our, in our schools is so necessary for the, their development of self, for their development of identity, um, for their understanding of the place in which they live, even our non-Indigenous students to learn the language um, of the land that they're on helps them understand that land, helps them understand the people that are, who originated there. Um, and down here at the bottom, language is healing. It really is. 
I think it's super important. And if you have the opportunity to incorporate it in your lessons in your classroom and the permission to, I recommend, I recommend it. Another thing in a rural community, most of the time, all your students are from that First Nations group. Um, a really high percentage of it anyways. So your school becomes like a culture hub as well, which is really cool. Um, in Dees Lake Public School, this is a, a, an event poster that I took from their Facebook page. Hopefully I was allowed to do that. Um, <laughs> I took from their Facebook page and essentially it's a call out, an event to come to the school gym and gut a caribou and a moose, cut up the meat, learn how to do it, and then take some meat home to your families. That is such an amazing thing. That's such an incredible activity to do with the community. It brings everybody together, everybody socializing, and it honors their way of being. It honors their, their worldview because where we're from, we're, we're hunters and gatherers, right? So it's honoring who they are and it's building community. You're, you would often see these kinds of things in our Northern communities. The next thing I wanna chat about is Tene Mehodihi. It's a land-based and culturally relevant education program created by a couple of my relatives, Thelma and Nathan Skivovius. Uh, they started this quite a while ago. And what it is, is a two-week adventure hike for Teltan youth in the summers. Students work closely with scientists from the University of British Columbia to collect samples from the land that are utilized in real research. So, Mentors from UBC fly all the way up there to our territory to work with these kids and teach them how to collect water samples, soil samples, and, and we have archaeologists who come up. And, and we even have artists, too, who come up as well to teach them um, tell tent art and things like this. Um, along all on the journey, there's culture, language, and STEAM. I put A in, in STEM there because sometimes we forget about art being science and it's part of it. Um, STEAM education, uh, both Western research methods and Teltan traditional knowledge are used on the adventure to prepare youth to be stewards of their land and waters. What I find to be super significant about this program is that they are taking these kids on trails that their ancestors actually would walk on. Their old hunting trails, their old, old trading trails. This two week adventure, they're going all the way up to Mount Zaidza, which is a volcano in our territory. It, and they're going to Telegraph Creek. So they're going quite a significant distance as well. And just being on the land, the land is their classroom again. Um, I'm involved with this right now, um, as much as I can be. I'm kind of on the admin side of things, helping with grants and, and other things like that. But my job, which is gonna be coming up maybe next year or the year, year after that, is I have to create a massive program guide for this and I have to connect all of this to the curriculum so that high school students from grade 9 to 12 can apply to do this but also get high school science credits when they do that which is going to be incredible for for them because they don't they often don't have a lot of science electives in the public schools because it's so remote ah, next thing Next thing I wanted to show you was a, uh, a unit plan made by an amazing Teltan educator as well. Do we have time for that? Yeah? <laughs> so this uh, unit plan is called, I'm going to do a, oops, I'm gonna exit out of this and I'm gonna go and share my screen again to a, I'm gonna stop share and go to my, here we go, share screen. Figuring things out. Desktop. I'm gonna go to this share. Can you see uh, the Teltan technology and applied design on Google Docs? Perfect. So a guy named Curtis Ratchery, who studied environmentalism, who is from the Teltan Nation, who works in our public schools and takes kids out on the land daily, created a unit plan on Teletan technology and applied design, bush skills and knowledge, campsites, fires, and shelters. And he found a way to make it all connect to the curriculum. And the thing that I love so much about a curriculum now is that it is so open-ended. It is so open. You can be so creative and you can make anything that you do matter and count as a curricular competency, which is so cool. Um, what he did was he, 
he used the uh, applied design skills and technologies curriculum for this. And the whole thing is designed using, this is like a 200 page document, by the way. Um, <laughs> the whole thing is designed using what are called Taltan values. Here we go. Taltan people are living the Taltan way of life. And these are a lot of, a lot of words all jumbled in here, but these are all the things that we hold dear as Taltans that, that mean a lot to us. And the core thing is our land, it's our territory. I don't expect you all to read that um, right now, but uh, <laughs> yeah. And then he connected to the curriculum, BC core competencies, amazing. Amazing. See, we can speak the, the institutional language too and make our cultural and make our cultural curriculum. <laughs> um, so I'm going to go down to page 98 to show you an example of a lesson plan that he made. And as you're going down to that, find that page, I'm thinking as I, what I saw of that values page, that I'm very fortunate to know Taltans who very much are so Taltans. Because that, that sounded a lot like you, Haley, and Anna Dosti too, who is on the, the chat and uh, and who I work with, and um, the two of you very much represent those values. So oh, it's, it's, that's so cool. They do. Okay, we're down here. He's got lessons from kindergarten to grade nine, so it's a lot. <laughs> so grade four to five projects. Let's look at that. So he's got. Design campsites and shelters. Cool. Awesome. Here we go. It's amazing how much is here. Like, it's just amazing to see how anybody, you know, um, can take this up. Like, one of the things that I say to the teacher candidates that I work with in Ontario sometimes is that there are these amazing lesson plans. Like, this one you're showing us, I've seen some from Saskatchewan as well. And like, I think they don't represent the art, the territory that we're on here in Ontario at all. And I think it's really important to recognize the diversity. But for me, it's like, a, it's a window into a nation that I don't know much about. I can learn so much more about and the, the ideas are there, right? And so I think what I love about educators is that we're so innovative and that you know give us like just give us this much and we can we can make it something. So I think that I or at least I hope that if any of our educators here in our audience today are not from uh, BC or on Taltan territory that they can take a look at this and learn something for themselves. And also, I wonder how it might apply, right? What that could look like in, in their classroom. Can they talk about the Taltan nation? Why not? I don't know. Why not? <laughs> Thank you for that. I'm sure. uh, I was just going to say too, like, um, it makes me think of some creative things people have had to do in Northern Ontario where there seems to be a, a glut of relevant science courses for the high school level. And uh, I remember a, a couple of teachers that I knew from Sioux Lookout that they used to do um, independent studies that they would just change into an, an indigenous way of knowing course. And on an annual basis, they just chose one Nishnabe technology and they had to do something with it. So if it was snowshoes, they had to make the snowshoes. And if it was a canoe, they made a canoe. And um, it's very much like this, where they, they, they went with designing something culturally relevant and then worked backwards to say, we hit all of these curriculum standards. So you guys get this grade 11 credit at the end of this. And uh, I, I think that there can be so much that we can do with this kind of approach where we will work backwards. And um, I'm curious if uh you know could could students from the south of bc sign up and and take this taltan learning as like, like a maybe like a class trip goes up or something and maybe we're not there yet <laughs> but that's a way he could uh, certainly offer an on the land experience to folks who are are um in the south and maybe craving this kind of a connection to the land well, actually, he has a company called Ed, something Adziza Trails, I think, where he actually does do that kind of stuff. Um, people sign up to go on adventures with him and that sort of thing. 
he's he'd probably be open. I'm not gonna speak for him, but he is an amazing human. All like all the people who I mentioned in this um, rural education piece and even above in the urban piece, they're just they're all amazing educators. Yeah. Um essentially I'm sharing I'm sharing this unit plan as a skeleton, as an as a seed, as something that you educators out there take a look at and and go, wow, I think I can do that. It, basically, he put it into a format that we as educators understand, like a lesson plan and a unit plan. And then he just put in the other stuff, like the culturally relevant activities. And we can do that too. Wherever you're located, wherever you're doing work, this is how you can make it make sense for your brain and also for um, the school principal that you, that the principal that you work for and the district that you work for um, to meet those learning goals. Another thing that John Paul mentioned is working, working backwards. I often do that. That's literally, I do that all the time. And then when I was in university, it would annoy some of my colleagues because I'd be like starting with all these amazing ideas and just blah, 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 this idea. Oh my God. And in my brain, I see how it all connects. But they're like, um, <laughs> we got to hand this assignment in by, you know, five days from now. Like, <laughs> we're not where you at right now. Like, tell us, tell us how to get there. <laughs> often frustrating to some people, but it's, a, it's an amazing process. If you start from the activity, start from the culturally, locally relevant thing, and then, then build curriculum after, <laughs> or then you know write all this stuff up after to uh, please the, the institution. <laughs> um, yeah, because yeah, it's, it's all there. It's, it's just a matter of, like you say, kind of spelling it out and, and, and <laughs> compartmentalizing it for them. Whereas yeah. you start from a whole, and then they want to see the pieces, right? So it's, <laughs> I think it's better than starting with the pieces and trying to make something out of it. Yeah, it leaves room for more creativity. <laughs> I'm gonna stop sharing this page and then I just have a couple slides on assessment. And that's it. Is that okay? Yeah, okay. That's, that's great. I think people are often asking questions about assessment, so I'm glad you're addressing it too. Yeah, it's a big yeah. one for educators. And I think I'm just seeing some questions in the chat. People have really great questions. Um, and just to clarify for everybody, um, this recording and the resources Haley's mentioning, um, they will be sent out through the Eventbrite sort of notification system in the next few days. I'll also be posting them on the website that I've been putting in the chat. Um, and um, if we're not going to get to your questions because we're, we're, you know, the, the time is going by and we want Haley to finish her thing, you know, Haley has offered uh, her email. So um, I will be sending that out as well with her permission um, in, in that email out to you. So Haley, take it away. Perfect. And if you want to do another webinar, <laughs> that'd be fun. <laughs> we, we, we've got yeah, time. we could always do a part two. That's, that's a great idea. Yeah. Uh. Okay, so the next section is assessment. So the first piece of assessment that I have here is taken directly from the unit plan that I just showed you. So these are the things that he's looking for um, during the unit. This is really cool that he put it in a rubric form. Uh, so applied skills, develop skills, and then grade. So these students have to, they do self-assessment it looks like, a number of cuts of firewood, uh, number of times the students makes student makes a fire, they have to record it. Um, respect the tools. That's that's a good thing to assess. Inspection of the team kit and the tools and the staff observations of respectful behavior. Amazing. Um, even boils water in here because when you're in the when you're in the bush, that's a that's a skill, <laughs> right? Um, you don't think you would need these skills, but you do. <laughs> it's an amazing um, rubric. I think. And then I have another one from his unit plan. Oops. So applied design assessment guidelines. So ideas, making, and sharing. Assessment criteria. Pretty straightforward. Explores the force. Looks around the force seeking firewood or, or building materials. Checks out other shelters and discusses or asks parents or, or researches other shelter designs. Oh. While making the fort, they explore other materials. Perfect, awesome. And uh, he actually took me out in the field with him. We went on a kindergarten um, lesson and we took the kids out in really deep snow. So the snow was like up to the kids' chests almost, little five-year-olds, it was really fun. And um, 
he showed us the shelter that he built with the students. So he built shelters with all the grade, all the grades at the school. So each class has their own area in the forest that they built their own shelter and they did all these things. And he like just has a checklist with him when he's doing, when he's, when he's doing all this stuff and they build fires and tell stories and, and that sort of things. And even when they build fires and even when they're telling stories, he's like doing check, check, checks with the students' names and that sort of thing. So everything that they're doing that's culturally and locally relevant is a part of their assessment, which is super cool. Um, then another one, so applied skills, curricular competencies overview of from, from K to nine. So these are the things that they're gonna be doing. Check on cool. I really see the engineering in this. I see the hands-on piece. I see the tools. You know, I see the, like, um, like, like you're saying, like the skills building, thinking about structures um, in all this assessment. And I love it. Emergency procedures, like ensuring, like this is, this is real life stuff, you know, like right? this is, this is hands-on real life. And I think what I'm really taking from this, not to put too, like a summary out, but you know, as a non-Indigenous educator, as a settler educator, I wonder if other people in the audience might also be nervous about, you know, where do I start? And what I'm taking from this is really about, it starts with relationship, right? It starts with honoring those knowledge keepers, those, and you, you Haley, have talked a little bit, especially at the beginning, but I know you, you do this, like you take the time, even a, like as a Talton woman yourself, to build those relationships, to show up with, at, with a gift to the elder's house over and over again. Um, and, you know, you, what I'm hearing from you and what I'm taking from this is that you don't show up with like, I don't know, like with like, this is my agenda, help me check this off, right? You really go in with an open heart. And I think that's why, you know, from your images, from the examples you've shared, um, you've been able to, to go so deep you know, because you go with what, what, what's emerging. It's not just like you have a plan. So you, I mean, not that you haven't put work into it, but I really love that. Like you're, you're able to go with what's, what's coming out for people. That's, it sounds, I mean, is that, is that accurate? Is, am I capturing it? Yeah, that's not accurate. I do have a plan, but I usually just make a skeleton of like what I want to accomplish. Mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. But when you're dealing with people, when you're dealing with relationships and as a teacher, our job, we have to be so flexible. Things go sideways so fast in the classroom. Lessons, pl lesson plans, you know, flop. Things mess up, you mess up. Oh, you gotta just roll with it. And relationship building is so key, so important. And you should approach this work with an open heart and an open mind, open spirit, because these relationships will, are probably gonna last a long time in your life. And people who you build relationships with in community are going to be vital to you doing this work. Yeah. The last slides I want to show are um, rubrics that will help you as educators design curriculum. If you are looking for some resources that just like, I need, I need to see it laid out. I need to see it written for me. <laughs> uh, a mentor of mine, somebody I look up to and, um, is a language champion that I like. I just I admire as well. Um, her name is Adosti Judy Thompson, and she created this wonderful resource called oh, not called. Here we go. I'm gonna put this down here because I can't see otherwise. Um, she created this rubric, and it was published in the First Nations Education Steering Committee um, resource for science. Um, it was also published in some research that she did. I'll share the links to that as well. And she would probably be happy that you would, you'd be using this. Essentially, she created it so that educators can incorporate um, Indigenous knowledge, Indigenous uh, traditional ecolo ecological knowledge. Did I say that right? <laughs> ecological knowledge in the classroom. And it's kind of like a guide, guideline. So first things first, protocol. It recognizes your curriculum, it recognizes that when working with specific indigenous communities and cultural experts that there are protocols to be followed. These are explicitly stated. Interesting, interesting. 
So you can read all that. I'm not going to read it all out for you. It'll be shared in a document for you later on. Um, but another thing is relationships with the land. Does your curriculum, does your lesson, does your, um, yeah, does your unit plan have concepts or activities related to relationship with the land? Ways of learning and ways of teaching. Are your ways of learning and teaching diverse? Are they different? Do you have hands-on activities, reading? Do you have digital? Do you have, like, it needs to be multidisciplinary and diverse because we have many different students with many different needs. And as educators, we know that, right? Next um, slide. Oops, I guess that was the second part. Uh -huh. <laughs> the first part. <laughs> um, indigenous voice, does your, does your unit comprise of that? Um, does your, your lesson plan have that? So did you consult with cultural experts? Um, did you consult with elders in the community, members that are involved, are indigenous um, people involved at all stages in the curriculum development? Um, do you have this? That is important. Um, if you don't have the, if you don't have that accessible, if you don't have the relationships, um, you can start building them. Um, or you can look at really authentic resources for your, for your um, lesson plans. Indigenous languages, again, if you have the permission, because some nations don't want the languages in the schools at all. And that's, that's for them to say, right? That's, that's for them to say yes or no to. But if they do have, if you do have permission, and if they are, if, you're, if it's welcomed, then incorporate it. Um, I know in our indigenous kindergarten class, we count to four in Lekwungen um, when we're doing things like in PE or whatever, or we're playing little games. It's just cute, it's fun. Um, we're, we don't know a lot of Lekwungen because there's, we don't have a lot of resources, but, um, but yeah, we do that. And then diversity amongst indigenous peoples. So that's another thing you can consider as well when you're making curriculum on indigenous topics. The focus of curriculum is on one particular indigenous group or the curriculum is flexible enough so that it can be adapted to other indigenous groups as well. Kind of like the curriculum that I showed you, the unit plan that I just showed you, I said it was a skeleton, um, kind of like something to plant the seed. You can kind of look at it and go, hey, I can do this, but I can do this in my territory and we can include culturally relevant activities for our kids. And yeah, that's, that's great. And if I was, knew at this and if I was a settler or if I or if I was somebody who didn't have this worldview that I have right now this might really help me in developing curriculum but why not for example when going on that fishing trip with those students like all of this was not all of it but some of this most of this was incorporated but it's something that I just kind of intuitively um, picked up from my learn from my lived experience as an indigenous person and from my ways of being and what I've been taught by my elders and from community members um, protocol first indigenous voice elders you know community members the families who came on the fishing trip and all these things right so um, this might help you Meducho to Adosti for creating this resource um, I recommend that you all check it out yeah and uh, then I just have uh, a classroom resource list here. That's very, it's short, but there's, there's lots more, there's a lot more links that'll send your way. That's, That's it. That's a Cho lot. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> Let's say Medio Cho for listening. Thank you very much. I really appreciated having this time with you, um, sharing what I've learned and picked up along the way. And um, I'm really excited to connect with those of you who want to connect with me and share your amazing, um, and share the amazing things that you're doing in your territories and in the places that you're living and working. So, you are so generous, uh, so generous with your time and your knowledge and putting all of this together. I know that it was a lot to take in. So that's why it's so great that these, uh, these webinars do get archived and Angela has been sharing the information in the chat. They'll be available on Twitter as well. So we can go and look at them on our own time and and explore all of the various um, resources that you've put together and shared and we'll add some of the other ones that were talked about um, this evening as well i want to thank all of the folks who stayed on with us even as we went over time i i think it's because it was just a, a testament to how interesting and and um, full of knowledge and 
ideas and creativity that this uh, this webinar was. So people wanted to stick around and learn. And also, where else are we going to go at this time? So, <laughs> I mean, I, that's right. Um, I am I myself am putting on the the pandemic pounds or the COVID <laughs> curves. I don't know. I got to flatten those curves too. So, <laughs> so there's uh, there's a lot to um, to digest here, and I think if we can we can take our time moving through all of them. We'll be really well prepared as educators. So I want to thank you, Haley, for bringing all of that to uh, tonight's webinar. Chimi Gwetch and uh, Mida. Yeah, thank you. Thank you both. Um, I will end this just by saying, Haley, um, you put so much into this and you put so much into everything you do clearly. Uh, and so thank you. Um, thank you for inviting in educators from all backgrounds into this work in such a beautiful way. I know um, we have people from all backgrounds here today. Um, this work is necessary. We need this work now, I think, more than ever. Um, folks, uh, I hope you will join John Paul and I if for future webinars. I want to say hi to all those who have joined us from the past. I, I saw a lot of familiar names and our new guests as well. So follow us on Twitter. I put that in the uh, chat or, or wherever you found about this webinar, keep listening. We've got another one coming up in May, as John Paul mentioned. Um, we're very excited to keep connected. This was just great. Listen, folks, you are the two uh, other adults other than my partner that I've seen today. So like, I just feel energized. I feel like I'm gonna be up for four more hours. You know what I mean? Just being like, woof, off of this human interaction. Um, so thank you both. And uh, I guess with that, I, any final words, either of you, before we say goodnight? Just thank you again for spending this time with me, learning with me and um, listening to my journey. I really am excited about this stuff. And I think that um, it's amazing, amazing work to bring Indigenous STEM into the classrooms and really focus on space education. Um, and I hope to connect with those of you who are also also passionate about that as well. And just want to say thank you, Haley. It was uh, I think we're all richer for the time with you this evening. Um, Chimi Gwetch again. Awesome. All right. Good night, everyone. Take good care. Stay, Stay safe. safe.